Okay, we'll continue. I'm, I'm very glad to introduce you to our next keynote speaker, uh, Alex McCall. Maybe you, you know him. He's the author of a great JavaScript library, Spine.js, and the author of a book, a really book, uh, Web JavaScript Web Applications is the title. So he's going to talk about the asynchronous user interface. So thank you, Alex. Thanks. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, how are all your hangovers? You recovering? <laughs> it's quite a party. Uh, I just want to say thank you. This is like been excellently organized, and this location is amazing. Uh, like these cages, just <laughs> how did they even get up there? It's incredible. <laughs> um, and also, I want to say kudos to people who are speaking uh, and it in English, and it isn't their first language. That's like it's nervous, like standing up here. Normally, like and English is my mother tongue, so that's uh, a lot of respect there. So asynchronous user interfaces, that's quite a mouthful. Um, it's more about how to lie, cheat, and steal, uh, basically. But first, I work at a company called Stripe in San Francisco. And we basically do online payments, a bit like PayPal, but we do it much better. Um, <laughs> we are going to come to Europe very soon. And I'm sure you'll hear about us when we do, because it's going to make your life a lot more easier when you're actually doing credit card transactions. So what makes design? This is quite an interesting question. Like, What are the components uh, to design? And a friend of mine uh, recently said, dribble is the worst thing that ever happened to design. Now, I don't know if you actually have used dribble, but it's basically a site where you can upload screenshots and um, comment, and like designers love it. And I, I don't agree with my friend. I think dribble is actually great. But he had some interesting points as to why uh, he thought this was the case. He says, Design and interaction are fundamental to each other. Like, you can't separate the two. And all Dribble really shows you is just pretty pictures. And it doesn't show you how the user is actually interacting uh, with the application. Uh, so it's divorcing the two, and these two things like fundamental to each other. Uh, so that's why he doesn't like it. So it's an interesting idea. So what, what makes interaction then? If design and interaction are fundamental to each other, then what makes in up interaction? Uh, I think one of the key things is speed. Uh, like speed is absolutely fundamental. Um, and it's not just actually making things fast, actually. So I used to work for this consultancy in London, and we did some of these airline flight uh, search engines. And I don't know if you use them, but you type in your flight details, and then some guy like points at you for a while, while like it says, you know, I'm searching, and uh, and then produces the results. And so I was looking at the code, and I noticed that this weight here is actually totally artificial. Right? We can search, we can get the flight results really quickly. But they put this weight in. And so I was like, OK, we can just remove the weight. Surely our users are going to appreciate that. It's much faster. But actually, conversion just plummeted. Like People actually expect there to be a weight. Uh, which is weird, right? But they, they think you're not searching properly for flights if there's no weight. <laughs> so we added the weight back in. Um, so it's not sometimes making things slow actually makes you more money. Uh, but actually, usually it's the opposite, right? Usually making things faster uh, makes more money. Like these, the Amazon, Google, Yahoo, the big three have revenues that are directly tied to the speed of the web applications. Like Amazon, 100 milliseconds of extra load time caused a 1% drop in sales. And 1% drop, you might think it's like tiny, but for Amazon scale, that's like huge. Um, and like Google and Yahoo, um, it's absolutely critical, like speed of the interface. Uh, like Google have actually added speed to their PageRank algorithm. So these three take speed really seriously. Um, but the, th the key thing to remember, it's not actually speed. It's perceived speed. And this gives us, as developers, a little bit of wriggle room. 
um, because we can use some psychological sort of cues to actually make the application seem faster than it really is. Um, so the thing about web applications is your the network is always going to be the bottleneck, at least for the foreseeable future. Like you can only make bits uh, go so fast. Like you can, can't go faster than the speed of light. And it's also something that you don't control. Um, so the user may be on a really slow connection. And so, so basically, whenever you're uh, you know, requesting new resources, it's going to be slow. So the key question is, why would you tie your interface to your network connection? If speed is so important, then surely you wouldn't tie like something that needs to be really fast to something that's always going to be pretty slow. Um, and the answer for that is because it's easy, because this is the convention, this is what people have done in the past, is how the, the web is set up. You have the request response model. Um, but I, I don't think it's enough. Like, I think people who actually make things fast will be rewarded. Uh, you can see the top, um, like, top three companies, they all take speed seriously, and there's a reason for that. Um, and all we've done over the last like, four years uh, you know, since Ajax has been introduced, is we've changed the location of the spinner, right? The spinner used to be at the bottom of the page, and now it's in the middle of the page. Um, and so we still have the same problem where we have, like, blocking interfaces. Uh, and, and, and things could be just so much better. So what are actually the asynchronous user interfaces? Well, the, the key thing is they, they don't block. So whenever the user interacts with your application, None of those interactions actually cause uh, the interface to block. Um, and the other thing is that they lie. Th they lie. And, and most engineers I talk to, this is the problem they have with asynchronous UIs. Because they actually present um, so a story to the user that isn't actually true. Um, they are lying about things that are going on behind the scenes. And to, en to an engineer, that seems crazy. Um, they, would, they don't want to be lied to. But it's actually a design. Uh, decision rather than engineering decision and like we get lied to the whole time there are like t tons of companies out there who lie to us like Twitter for example um, whenever you click retweet it appears to have retweeted the pay the um, the tweet instantly but in reality it has to send a network request has to go in a messaging queue there are like four processes until finally a bit is flipped in the database so, like, in the interface, the retweet is displayed instantly. Um, and, and then the network request is sent in the background. And the same goes for, like, tweeting or, or responding to tweets. Like, we insert those tweets directly into the user's timeline and then send off network requests in the background. And the same with Facebook. The whole of Facebook's user interface is asynchronous. Uh, when you click like, the page gets liked immediately, even though, like, in reality, it hasn't got liked for quite a while as it, as it sends the network request. When you comment, it's the same. Uh, when you enter something in the search bar, as soon as you click up there, they send a request, uh, basically heating up the cache. They're saying, this guy is about to type, like, get all his friends' uh, information and heat up the cache so things are really fast. So these, Facebook take a number of steps to make their site really fast. Like Pinterest, and these guys do really aggressive scrolling, like auto-scrolling. As you scroll down to the bottom, like new content loads in. Like, have you ever tried to scroll to the bottom of Pinterest? Like, I don't think it exists. Uh, as, like, as you get two-thirds of the way down, they, they, they load in like a ton of new content. They, they cache it. It's really fast. Um, and the thing is, it's really aggressive. A lot of that data is going to be wasted. A lot of people are not going to see like pretty much every session is going to have wasted data, but like it's worth it for them. It's like a design decision that they have made to basically make the user interface better. And it's not just uh, web applications, mobile applications too. So Instagram is a great example of an async UI, and I think actually one of the reasons that they were so successful. So when you like something in Instagram, it appears liked in the interface instantly and then sends a network request. When you comment, it's instant. Um, and also when you sign up, as you're filling in this form, you can see the network indicator at the top going. And basically what it's doing is going to fetch like a ton of images. So as soon as you signed up, 
you can see this whole portfolio of like images in front of you, and you have this really nice experience. I think the most interesting part of pin, um, Instagram is the upload process. Right, so most uh, web applications, so they would upload here. So you select the photo, you fill in the information, you click share, and then it gets uploaded. And as an engineer, you think that is like the only place that you know the user actually wants to upload that photo, right? At any stage before, they could actually cancel the whole process. Um, where do they actually upload the photo? They actually upload it at this stage. Uh, so you select the photo, you fill in this form, and as you're filling in the form, the photo is being uploaded in the background. And this means that they waste data. Like, pro probably like 10% of people like click cancel or back. Uh, they waste data, they waste money. But this is a design decision, not an engineering decision. And, uh, and it makes sense. It's got a much better uh, feel to it because everything feels much more instant. And it's funny that the, the probably the worst app on the App Store is the App Store, right? Uh, like it's a slow thing, but it's not like uh, native versus web. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's rendering on the client versus rendering on the server. So they do all their rendering on the server, and it means that the client is unintelligent. They can't like dynamically populate, they can't cache properly on the client, and so things are slow. And we're used to this on the desktop world. We're used to this request response model on the web. But this stands out in the mobile world because A, you have slow connections, and B, pretty much every other mobile app is asynchronous. It has an asynchronous user interface. So like, you really notice this on, uh, on mobiles. So my question to you is, why would you optimize for failure? So 99% of those network requests are going to go through fine. So why not just assume they're going to go through fine? Uh, if they do fail, then there's various things you can do. But I think like, you should basically optimize for the most common case. So I've been doing a bunch of work on Subtle, which is this blogging platform by Dustin Curtis. And it's sort of minimalist inspired design. So there's hardly any interface. Uh, all you see is the text. And uh, then you start writing. Like, there's no WYSIWYG editor, no formatting options. And I love it. Like, it really inspires me to write. Um, but we've be recently been like, implementing this uh, upload uh, image process. And this is quite difficult to do. Like, how, how do you fit like, an image upload into this? There's no interface. Like, where do you put the browse button? Where do you put the progress? Uh, but what I, did, what I realized as an end user, this is what I wanted. I wanted to be writing my article. I wanted to drag a file on, from the desktop onto it. I wanted the markdown for that image to be put instantly into the text. And then I wanted to carry on writing. And I wanted it to seem like the photo had been instantly uploaded. Right? So this is what we made. Um, we used the HTML5 like drag and drop API. We got this proprietary function drop area, which is basically a jQuery plugin I wrote that cancels a bunch of the drag drop events, which you just need to get the whole API working, actually. And then we bind to the drop event. We're preventing default because it turns out the default uh, is to actually navigate to whatever file you drag onto the web page. Uh, we access the original event because jQuery proxies it. And then we basically iterate over every file and if it's an image, we call this a create attachment function. Um, so the secret source to this create attachment function is client-side UIDs. The idea is that we generate a UID on the client and then save that along with the image. Uh, and then basically, whenever that image is referenced in the future, uh, we use that UID. And the fact that we're generating a UID on the client means that we can like, instantly insert that image into the text. We don't have to wait for the server to respond with the database ID. Um, so that's what we're doing. The first line of a create attachment, we're generating this UID. Like, this is a really basic. We're just ba taking the, um, the username of the person and then the current time. And that's just to ensure that these things are going to be unique, or at least very likely to be uni unique. And then we use HTML5's form data uh, class, which is pretty unknown, but it's really useful. 
if you're ever doing multi-part uploads, definitely use form data. Um, because if you, if you don't, then you have to do all the multi-part like parsing yourself. Uh, and then we're basically uploading the file and the UID uh, to the server. Uh, we, we're calling jQuery's AJAX function, we're passing it all in. So that's being uploaded in the background. And the key thing, like I was saying before, is we want instant feedback. We want to be able to drag this image onto the text editor and basically have it inserted immediately. So the user feels the interface is fast, like the user thinks the image has been uploaded instantly. Um, so the last line of the create attachment function is this. We're generating the markdown for the image and then we're inserting it directly into the text. Um, and this UID is going to be used on the server, so whenever um, you actually navigate to that UID, then the file will be returned. And this interface is great because the, the, the idea is that you write your text, you drag the file on, and then by the time you've finished writing your text, uh, the file will have been uploaded and you can see it instantly. Like, we don't need an pro upload progress. Um, we just have this asynchronous UI. So let's step back a little and look at the parts to an asynchronous UI. Uh, it's key things, render on the client, store state and data on the client, and communicate with the server asynchronously. So the last one is the idea that you, ba you basically update the interface before you send any network requests off to the server. You basically pretend the server isn't there. Um, so rendering on the client is pretty easy and fast, whatever anybody tells you. Like, this is a solved problem. I mean, the hard part is actually deciding which templating library you want to use, right? There are just so many. Um, like, I would look at a few of them. Like, my favorite actually is Eco, uh, but have a look at a few of them. Uh, the main difference between them is some of them basically allow you to uh, compile templates on the server and then render on the client. And this is quite a good idea because that saves a bit of uh, time for the client. The client doesn't have to actually compile the templates. All it has to do is execute a function. So, if you're like using Rails, for example, all you have to do is rename a file to .eco and then it'll use eco as a templating language. Like, it's, it's that simple. And the, form, the syntax looks exactly like RHTML, actually, but it's actually CoffeeScript. Um, and then, you just, you, if you give the file .jst extension, then it will create this global object called JST, and that's the function. And you can just execute it and pass the context. Um, it's that easy. Now, I've been working on this app called Stylo App. I don't know if the internet is good enough, but if it is, you should check it out. Um, and it basically is a WYSIWYG for, um, uh, for designing user interfaces. And there's, it's quite complex. There's a fair amount going on here. You can select and new elements, you can resize them, you can change the color, it's all rendered in CSS and HTML, and it's actually open source. Um, but the idea had quite a lot of fun, like optimizing it. For example, this, this right-hand column, whenever you select a new element, the whole right-hand column uh, basically refreshes. And this is fine for like 10 elements, but when you have 1,000 and you're selecting the mouse over all these elements, and the whole sidebar is re-rendering each time, it gets really slow. Uh, so there's a couple of tricks you can do for this. Uh, request animation frame basically tells the browser to like render an e an element when it's ready, um, and this like basically reduces the amount of paint the browser has to do, and uh, makes things much faster. Um, the other one is the batch up DOM updates. So actually rendering views won't be your bottleneck. It'll be uh, communicating with the DOM. Uh, so basically, do that as little as possible, and do little, as little paints as possible. So one good trick is basically uh, hiding elements, and then manipulating their contents, and then showing them, and then the, there will only be one paint. Um, so so like, like I say, actually rendering is fast on the client, it's just communicating with a DOM that's slow. So Catapult uh, is a little project I've been making. You can install it as a Ruby gem, gem install catapult. And it's, it's a really simple way of compiling uh, these, these templates and, and these apps. Like, personally, I don't use Rails, I use Sinatra, and so catapult um, fits into my line of development a bit, long, a bit better. 
So you can like generate a new application, generates a bunch of files, uh, and then you can like start a server, build it to disk when you deploy to production, or just watch it and then it will build whenever the, any file changes. Uh, and it uses sprockets. Uh, so you can just add some meta comments to like require jQuery, require tree. Like if you're familiar with Rails, then you'll probably be very familiar with this. Um, and so actually uh, compiling apps and compiling templates, that's pretty straightforward. That's a solved problem. Um, but when it comes to storing state and data on the client, now this is slightly more tricky because this actually uh, takes a lot of thinking about because it's very different from conventional request response models. Uh, luckily, we have some great frameworks out there. We have Backbone, we have Spine, um, we have Ember, um, and there are some also some books I hear about these things. And so you 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 just have to follow the conventions and actually use MVC and render and keep state on the client. So the the key thing is to store state in the controllers and data in the models. And I often see people mixing this up and getting this wrong, and I, that's like the, um, the, you get code spaghetti if you do that. So the key thing is to adhere to MVC and um, keep state in the controllers and data in the models. And the other thing is to preload data. So there's no point if we have this whole asynchronous UI, if we're basically got the little spinner going anyway while we're doing an AJAX request to fetch the, um, the data all the, the whole time. So the, what I do is basically preload like a huge bunch of JSON uh, and it's like a big object. So I preload the users and the assets, and you can see it's all nestled. And like, there's no doubt that some of this data will be wasted, right? The user is not going to look at all this data, but it's better. It's better that way. It's a, it's a be better experience because they can access it instantly on the client. So validation on the client, like the issue with validation on the client is that you're doubling it up, right? You have validation on the server. You have validation on the client, but the good thing about validation on the client is that it's instant, right? You don't have to do any re um, request to the server to actually uh, get a res validation response. Um, and with Backbone and Spine, all you have to do is basically take a function, a validate function on your model, and return a string if validation fails. And you can do most types of validation on the client. Uh, like some of them you can't do. Like the, the the commonest one is uniqueness validation. So the client doesn't have all the the models. Uh, it doesn't have all the records. Uh, so it can't actually do uniqueness validation. That is something you're going to have to communicate to the server to achieve. Uh, and there's like various tricks to get around this. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Twitter, when you're signing up and you're entering a username, uh, it's actually validating as you type. Um, so by the time you finish that form, and it's actually done the validation uh, of the uniqueness of the username, and so you don't have to ha actually have a wait and this request round response. So the other thing is asynchronous ser server communication, and I put up this little demo at uh, spainjs.herokuapp.com, uh, and, and I don't know if, if the internet is fast enough. But basically, I, the initial version I actually included some latency, but I took that out. Um, so let me just show you this demo. So we, it's basically a very simple chat model. And we have two panes here. Um, we can type in one. Let's type Alex. Go. And if you go navigate to this, you can start chatting with me, by the way. We can call this one John. Um, so this is quite, uh, ah, here we go. We've got some people. So I've noticed about this uh, demo is the first message is like, hello world. And the second message is like some cross-site scripting attack. Um, so I've escaped everything. So you can't, you can't get around that. So there's basically two versions of this demo. One is um, synchronous. So you, when you type in here, um, you say, hello. Um, you press enter, and you have to wait until the server responds. right? Uh, and that takes like a few seconds. Uh, the other way is uh, asynchronous. 
basically, you just assume the server is going to respond correctly. Um, so if we type something here, uh, you'll see it in the interface immediately. Uh, now, it hasn't actually been broadcasted to everybody yet, but to the user, it feels that way, and the, the whole interface feels a lot faster, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, just like simple tricks like that. So like the actual source looks like this. This is the first version. This is the synchronous one. Uh, we're adding a message when we got a successful response from the server. The second one, we just put the function below it. Uh, we add the uh, function. We add the message straight away because the vast amount of the time the server would be like, "That's fair enough." Um, you know, we'll just add that message. The other thing, look, quick tangent. If you haven't used Sinatra, it's incredible. This is how you do that streaming. Uh, this is all the code that's required. Um, you set up a, a, a stream, and then you use um, uh, HTML5 server events to basically send data. And this is what WebSockets really should have been. Uh, all you, the protocol is basically data, colon, message, new line, new line. And like you, if WebSockets, you need like three or four different libraries. Like if you've ever seen the protocol, it's like times this number by five if it's a Tuesday or something. It's just it's an insane protocol. And then anyway, so if you just want to stream to clients, then this is the way to do it. And then you can open up an event source stream to that server, and this function will be executed whenever that. Uh, you, a new message comes along. So what does Spine and Backbone actually give you uh, to help with these async UIs? Well, what the key, one of the key things is a client-side ID. Uh, now this makes it really convenient because you can have a server-side generated ID and you have a client-side generated ID and the client-side generated ID stays in the client and if you want to basically reference a, a record then you can, uh, you can, you can use the client-side ID. For example, if you want to reference it in the URL. Um, and then the server ID can be populated later when the server actually responds. Uh, we have an asynchronous model API, so when you save something, uh, events are fired that update the user interface before AJAX requests are sent. And then in Spine, not Backbone yet, but Spine, we have serial AJAX requests. So the, one of the issues with this async UI is, is let's say somebody creates a record, updates that same record, and then deletes the record like really quickly before the server has a chance to respond. Um, and so the server is going to re receive this delete re uh, re request and it's going to be like, I've never heard of this record before and it's going to freak out. Um, so you basically send or put and post um, uh, AJAX requests serially. So you send them one after each other. And Spine will do that automatically for you. And like, like I say, the model um, has an asynchronous UI. All you have to do is call save on it. Uh, and in Backbone, they've got this neat thing where you can, if you don't want a, an asynchronous UI, i.e. if you don't want the interface to be updated before the network request is sent, you just pass this wait true option. Uh, and then this is basically uh, what the API looks like. You have a render function. You may bind to like a change event on the model. So whenever that model basically gets updated, uh, then the whole view is going to re-render. And then when this update function is going to be called, then the model uh, save function is going to be called. And this is going to basically fire the change event, update the UI, and then later on it's going to send off that AJAX request. So what do you do if the user closes the window while requests are still pending? Uh, and this is another pretty easy one. Uh, there's this on beforehand function you can uh, set, or events you can set. And jQuery or active is this uh, unknown property of jQuery, but basically it's uh, the number of active AJAX requests. And if it's zero, um, then this won't return a string. If it's any more, then it'll still return a string. And you can basically prompt the user and say, are you sure you want to close this? There are some network requests still pending. Things might not have been saved. Uh, and what do you do when the server fails? Uh, my answer to this is pretty simple. Uh, if you have a look at Twitter and Facebook, uh, what do they do when the server fails? Uh, they just pop up a message saying, can you reload the window? Um, and the reason for this is that like, as soon as the server fails, the, um, the context on the server and the context on the client are out of sync. And it's really tricky to get these back into sync. And like, honestly, the easiest thing is just to say, refresh the page. 
because this is only going to happen like a few times. If you have like written all your server code well, then this shouldn't happen a lot. So you shouldn't optimize for this scenario because it's pretty unlikely. So let's quick recap. The, the, the idea behind asynchronous UI is to lie, cheat, and steal. You basically lie to clients. You say the interface is updated before, it, uh, before you know, things in the database have actually saved. Um, you, you, you cheat and you steal, you steal data. You intelligently preload data um, when the client is not looking, basically. Um, and you do all the rendering and, and state on the client. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>